Hey, what's up everybody? It's Chris from IMA again. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the perfusion triangle and how that correlates to shock. If you haven't already checked out our video uh, that covers blood circulation through the body, uh, that's a good video to watch before this one just so you have a little bit of a better understanding about the heart and the pump that we're gonna talk about in the perfusion triangle. Uh, but yeah, let's go get started. So I remember uh, back when I first went through EMT school, uh, learning about shock, it seemed really simple, right? When a patient's blood pressure drops below 90, then that means they're in shock. That's not really wrong, but it's just kind of a smaller part of a much larger concept that you really need to understand if you're gonna be a competent EMT working out there in the field. Uh, so let's take a look at shock and talk more specifically about the perfusion triangle. So, um, we need to remember that shock is not just a blood pressure dropping. Shock is actually the state of inadequate perfusion. So we need to remember that perfusion is the adequate flow of blood and its contents to the organs and the cells. So we need to be getting blood with its oxygen and its glucose and uh, everything else to the heart, to the lungs, to the brain, to all the vital organs, uh, as well as to the skin, because the skin's an organ. Um, and if we're not achieving that, then that is when we do not have adequate perfusion, which means that we are in a state of shock. So the adequate perfusion is going to depend on the three different parts of the perfusion triangle. And so hopefully you've seen the perfusion triangle before. Uh, if not, it's pretty basic. Uh, there's three parts to it. That's why it's called the perfusion triangle. Uh, the first part that we need to talk about is going to be the heart. The second part is going to be the vessels. And the third part is going to be our blood or our fluid within the system. So I like to think about uh, the heart as a pump that is pumping the fluid or the blood through those pipes and back into itself, kind of like a circle, right? Um, and so all three of those aspects need to be working correctly. Uh, if one of the, those parts of the triangle begins to fail, the body is going to compensate by affecting a change to a different part of the perfusion triangle to try to maintain homeostasis. And remember, homeostasis is what our body is really always trying to achieve. Uh, homeostasis is that, that baseline uh, of the body being normal. So um, that is us having that adequate perfusion. So like I said, when uh, one of those parts of the perfusion triangle starts to fail, um, some other part will need to compensate for it. So uh, a simple example of that is when the body increases the heart rate to maintain, to maintain the same cardiac output. So hopefully you remember the equation for cardiac output. Uh, if not, it's pretty simple. It's going to be heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output. So uh, heart rate is going to be over a minute and stroke volume is going to be uh, how much blood is ejected with each pump of the heart. And so if we multiply that, those two numbers, we're gonna get the cardiac output or how much blood is being ejected from the heart to the body per minute. So let's look at that equation for just a normal adult male. Uh, the average cardiac output for an adult uh, is gonna be five to six liters or 5,000 to 6,000 milliliters a minute. So remember uh, 1,000 milliliters is going to be one liter. So five to six liters or 5,000 to 6,000 milliliters a minute. So for this equation, uh, we're just going to say the, uh, the cardiac output for this patient is going to be 6 liters or 6,000 milliliters. If that patient's resting heart rate is 60 beats per minute, then to achieve a cardiac output of 6,000 milliliters or 6 liters, their stroke volume needs to be 100 milliliters. So if we put that into an equation, it will be 60 times 100 equals 6,000. So 60 beats per minute with 100 milliliters per beat equals 6,000 milliliters of blood being ejected per minute uh, or six liters per minute. So um, let's take that same patient and now let's say their stroke volume drops for whatever reason. Maybe they have a tension pneumothorax, their heart's not able to fill as fully with blood as it would normally and so uh, the contraction of the heart is expelling less blood or maybe there's some fluid loss because of bleeding, whatever it is. Let's just say that their stroke volume uh, is cut in half to 500 milliliters. Now for us to achieve the same amount uh, of cardiac output at 6,000 milliliters, 
we're gonna need to double the heart rate because the stroke volume is cut in half. And so that is, that is compensation. Um, we're seeing that heart rate go up because the volume is going down, but we need to maintain that homeostasis. And so the cardiac output needs to stay the same, right? So like I said, that heart rate is doubling to compensate for the decrease in stroke volume. So increasing the heart rate is not the only way the body can compensate. Uh, the body can cause vasoconstriction to reduce the size of those vessels. And if the size of the vessels is reduced, the pressure within that system is going to go up. Um, so it can do that. Uh, it can produce more blood to help reduce that blood volume. Um, but when we're thinking about emergency medicine, we need to remember that some of those compensatory mechanisms are slow and they maybe don't have uh, time to help that patient maintain homeostasis. So um, increased blood production by the body is gonna take uh, a long time and isn't gonna help somebody who was just shot or stabbed and is bleeding profusely. Um, so we need to remember that in the context of compensatory and decom decompensated shock. So hopefully now you have a bit more of an, an understanding of the perfusion triangle. Like I said, it's a pretty basic concept, but it's really good for us to understand so we can start to understand compensation uh, and just how the body compensates in general. Um, so let's relate that a little bit more back to shock. So when we're talking about shock, shock has three different stages. We have compensated shock, decompensated shock, and irreversible shock. So there's not really any way for us to know when a patient uh, has reached irreversible shock. So we're just gonna talk more about compensated and decompensated shock. Um, so compensated shock is when th one of those three parts of the perfusion triangle starts to fail, but the other parts are able to fill in the gaps and maintain that homeostasis. So the patient's blood pressure typically will stay within the normal range. Uh, they're gonna be mentating normally, so they shouldn't have an altered level of consciousness. Typically, if they're in compensated shock, they're talking to you normally, um, but when we do our thorough assessment, we are likely to see some, some subtle hints of that. Uh, some pale skin, maybe some mild tachycardia. Those things are the things that we'll see when a patient is in early stages of shock. Uh, if we can start to put those pieces together uh, with other pieces of the story, like the mechanism of, of injury or nature of illness, uh, the patient history, those kind of things, then it can start to paint a clear picture that that patient is in compensated shock. So, uh, going back to that patient who maybe was shot or stabbed, if we have a patient who was shot and now we see that their, their heart rate is 110 and they look a little bit pale, even though their blood pressure still might be 120 over 80, um, we know that they are in a state of shock. Uh, and I like to think of shock as kind of like a bell curve or maybe just um, kind of like a downhill slope. So we have homeostasis being maintained, we start to go into compensated shock, and then we'll get to the point where we're in decompensated shock and we're gonna to start to see some changes there. Um, so another, another uh, example for you, we could say that you're dispatched to a patient, uh, it's an auto versus pedestrian, so the patient was walking across the street and was struck by a vehicle. Um, they're complaining of some abdominal pain after being struck uh, and you can tell there's a little guarding to the abdomen when you palpate, so it feels a little, a little rigid. You can see that they're trying to protect that abdomen. Um, normally, if we have a patient uh, in that situation, that on its own is not very concerning. Now, if I tell you that the patient's heart rate is 126 per minute and their skin is starting to look a little bit pale, uh, maybe they're a little bit anxious, their breathing rate is elevated at 22 a minute, now we start to see all those different puzzle pieces, we put those together. Now we're seeing the patient's actually showing signs of being in compensated shock and those complaints might actually point to some internal bleeding. Okay, um, so that's gonna be the compensated stage of shock. Uh, and like I said, um, we're gonna start in the compensated uh, side of shock. So hopefully you're recognizing those, those simple things and then decompensated shock is going to be when the patient has gone to the point uh, where the fail safes of the perfusion triangle uh, are no longer able to compensate. So that's when we start to see um, a decreased blood pressure, so dropping below 90 systolic. Uh, we'll maybe see that change in orientation because the blood uh, is not getting to the brain. There's not enough pressure to really perfuse the brain, and so we might see that um, played out with uh, some change in mentation. Um, skin signs really start to fail. 
uh, those are the things we'll start to see there. So um, like I said, when we, we have that kind of slope, um, we're going to start compensation and then we're going to move to decompensation. Uh, and usually for us, that's, that's a very bad sign for a patient. Um, at some point, that patient will go into irreversible shock. But like I said, we don't really know uh, when that is. Irreversible shock, by definition, is typically just uh, a stage of shock where they are so profoundly um, in shock that they are, there's no chance of them coming back despite um, having a trauma surgeon or whatever interventions. That's going to be irreversible shock. Uh, we don't know when a, when a patient hits that point. And so we're not going to treat anything any differently. Um, we just need to be able to recognize if a patient is in that compensated shock versus that decompensated shock. All right, so that was some quick basic information about that perfusion triangle and how that relates to the different stages of shock. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into shock, the different types of shock, and how uh, that affects the body and how the body has to compensate for those things. But having this baseline understanding of compensated versus decompensated shock and how that perfusion triangle relates to that is what allows us to start to see those subtle signs so that we can recognize a patient before they get into a state of decompensated shock. Because we don't want to get behind the eight ball. Everybody has probably heard about, um, about the golden hour, maybe the platinum 10 minutes. Uh, and that's where we need to get the patient to definitive care within an hour. And the platinum 10 is one where we need to get the patient moved, packaged, and transported within 10 minutes. And that's what we need to recognize so that in that, that hour, the patient doesn't die on us because we're dragging our feet because we don't see that change in blood pressures. So we want you guys to be thinking EMTs. We want you to be above the level where you, all you're looking at is blood pressures and think about those other subtle signs and symptoms uh, when we're talking about shock. So like I said, hopefully that's helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions about shock or there's some other uh, aspects of shock you'd like us to do a video about, just drop that in the comments and we'll see about doing that for you. Otherwise, like always, make sure to check out other videos. We'd love if you subscribe. That's really helpful for us. And we'll catch you guys on the next one. Thank you.